uh, anniversary, I think, of the beginning of DICE. And I just want to thank all the organizers uh, for their hard work, especially Thomas. Uh, where is Thomas? Thomas has defended the lion's share of work I at this with <laughs> a good part of that. He's so humble to ask me to hush hush. Uh, and I think uh, especially after COVID, uh, we all the organizers a bit uh, applause of thanks. So I'll just go ahead uh, with uh, this topic. Um, it actually covers three uh, topics. Uh, one is gravitational decoherence. The other is gravitational cat and state. This is easier. And then the third one, more recently, in the last two years, uh, gravitational uh, graviton noise. And all these actually have um, experimental implications. And in fact, um, there are uh, experiments proposed for these uh, three aspects. But the theoretical underpinning, and that's what I really want to get uh, through in this uh, short 30 minutes, is the theory known as stochastic gravity. I think most of you are probably not familiar with this, even though it was uh, established in uh, 94, uh, by the end of the 90s, is quite well uh, uh, perfected. Um, it's the, well, let me switch to the next slide. Where is the arrow? Down here. <laughs> Tiny one, yeah. Okay, so those three topics uh, actually bear on uh, quantum, gravity, and information. <laughs> I don't want to say quantum gravity. Uh, and it's basically general relativity and quantum field theory. And if you uh, bring them together, it's quantum field theory and curved space time, developed mostly in the 70s. And then an upgrade in terms of considering the uh, quantum field matter uh, and the background geometry uh, in the cell system, I mean, you get cell semi-classical gravity developed in the 80s and in the 90s, the classic gravity. The difference is that in addition to the expectation value, which is really a mean field theory, we add on uh, correlations or fluctuations that goes on two uh, sides of the same coin. But there's uh, other um, important uh, development which made this uh, threefold uh, combined consideration, the G, the Q, and I, uh, possible. One is the uh, in the step max statistical mechanics uh, area, arena, uh, the development of non equilibrium quantum processes, in particular uh, via quantum field theory. And the uh, open quantum systems, which now is also developed, uh, applied to early universe cosmology. In particular, I'd like to point out the non-Markovian aspects uh, because most of the uh, stochastic processes that we learn are uh, and applied uh, to uh, in the field of uh, uh, quantum optics. And it would be sufficient for most purposes to deal with uh, Markovian processes. But it's about time that we should actually take uh, processes with memory seriously. I just mentioned uh, some representative work where you can find uh, references, uh, <coughs> earlier references, or the references of work since then. Uh, can now it's already been 30 years. And then in the mid-90s, as you all know, um, the rapid development of quantum information uh, of course, the funding agency is very eager uh, because of quantum computer, so which is very nice for uh, uh, theoretical physics development. And in quantum information, I will just single out two aspects, as I mentioned earlier. One is the coherence, and the other is entanglement. In fact, the question is, how does the environment affect the quantum coherence of a system? 
decoherence. Um, and in fact, it's very important uh, if you have some really cute idea and try to convince people to give you a shallow uh, big bundle of money, the first thing you need to do is calculate your decoherence time. If it's not long enough to perform any quantum computing, uh, don't ever try to submit anything. So you can understand why uh, for the last 30 years um, that has been uh, a focus of um, attention in almost all fields, in particular the, um, the experimental um, realms of uh, quantum optics, atom, MO, uh, superconductivity, so on and so forth, quite a few. The other issue, of course, is entanglement. Entanglement being the resource of quantum information processing, uh, how to make good use of it. And with an environment, unfortunately, it goes the other way. Uh, it's called disentanglement. Now, so what, uh, th these are well known. In, in fact, Nobel Prizes were awarded for these two areas, for example. But uh, what's new here for us is gravitational, the source being gravity, and so it's called gravitational decoherence by noises of gravitational origin. And for entanglement, uh, this cute name, the gravitational cat states uh, from the entanglement of two masses, um, <coughs> which also has caught a lot of attention uh, from experimental proposals. Um, I don't think there's any experiment that's been carried out yet. All right, so I think I could skip this, but just mention that stochastic gravity has been applied mainly, and I think people's uh, attention were drawn to early universe processes near the Planck scale, uh, slightly below the Planck scale, and also black hole uh, quantum processes like uh, Hawking radiation, the back reaction would it change uh, what we know already about the Hawking radiation uh, and of course with that uh, the final state of uh, black hole collapse and uh, information issues. There's a lot of that. But the surprising thing um, is I want to uh, convince you that actually carrying our experiments in the laboratory under weak few non-relativistic conditions you still need stochastic gravity. That's a big surprise because people say, well, all right, you guys invented all these things, you do your stuff. It would never show anything. We, we would never know whether the black hole would end up like uh, with a singularity or what it is and so on and so forth. I want you to know that we need that, okay, even for carrying experiments that I just described that we proposed a lot. Now, and of course, there are deeper philosophical issues about uh, gravity, whether it's fundamental or emergent. Okay. All right. So um, I guess I'll just uh, skip over uh, a lot of that and just point out the highlights uh, because there are three groups of papers uh, going back to 20, I don't know, about seven, eight years ago. There's no time for that, but I think I, if I could just point out the succinct. Uh, aspects that will be good enough. All right. Um, right, so the first part is a little bit about stochastic gravity and the quantum gravity motion by way of the influence functional method. That's the only way that I see how noise can be introduced in a perfectly, um, in a complete quantum field theoretical setting. Of course, stochastic processes has been there for a long time. But people usually say, well, let's put this noise in by hand. Usually start with a white noise, gets more sophisticated. You see that what's demanded here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from the level of semi-classical gravity on, of course, uh, including also stochastic gravity, is self-consistency, back reaction self-consistency. All right, so let's move on. Um, Gravitational decoherence by noise of gravitational origin. Uh, let me skip over the alternative quantum theory aspect. Uh, there's a lot of development since the uh, 60s, including uh, Leroy's here, uh, the D.O.C. Pernod's, uh, Garadi, Rumini, Weber, Pearl Bassi, at all. Uh, they want to explain 
um, the collapse of the wave function. So you can see that the decoherence that they want is decoherence in real space. Right? You can see the wave function collapse at a local point, uh, space and point. Whereas if you take general relativity and uh, quantum mechanics, the decoherence is in the energy basis. So this is not difficult to understand uh, from the Einstein's uh, uh, ideas behind it. And so that's the big difference between uh, the theory that we worked out, the, the master equation that Harris and Sadler's and uh, Max Blanco uh, worked out uh, independently. The, let me, so, so this is the this a pointer. We use the mouse for a pointer, right? Okay. So if you look at this uh, master equation, this is probably the scary part, but of course you know that that's really the it's okay, thank you. Yeah. But that's just a projection operator, right? For we're dealing with, with tensor quantities. And that's just the energy. And in fact, if I look at the simplified case, right, you see that that's really the p square. So it's the energy basis. This is the typical one that you see in all the uh, Markovian uh, master equations, like of the Lindblad form. All right, so I just want to point out that there is actually a free parameter, sorry. Wow. That's the penalty of not doing it step by step. All right, so there is this uh, uh, temperature parameter, we call it, right? It's a free parameter. And if you do everything without putting in anything by hand, it is at plant scale. So the gravitational decoherence from GL and uh, quantum mechanics is quite ne negligible. However, if you allow for gravity to be emergent, uh, the theta could be much lower. Because in that case, we look, what we're looking at general relativity is the hydrodynamic limit. It's the long wave length, low energy limit. And just like hydrodynamics in relation to molecular dynamics, there's always some scale where you can see the picture change over. And in fact, totally different. That's the amazing thing about hydrodynamics. You don't really need to know the details of the microscopic structure or the dynamics. It has its own laws, it has its own symmetry, so on and so forth. Which is, of course, the way I look at general relativity. All right, so that's one way. Uh, if one day somebody is clever enough to uh, be able to identify some uh, phenomena to be due to gravitational coherence, there's some hope that we could, through the theta uh, parameter, uh, discern whether gravity is fundamental or uh, emergent. Also, uh, the reason why we added this subtopic, the texture, that's mainly because of my experience working on quantum gravity and motion. As you all know, the environment is characterized by actually two factors, not just one, the temperature, certainly. And this makes a big difference if it's high temperature only, you get the Markovian limit. The other is the spectral density, okay? It's not exactly microscopic, but it gives you uh, a measure of what different uh, environments would act on, right? So, so we call it the texture, kind of the mesoscopic picture between the micro and the macro. And so um, maybe someday we'll put at least uh, probe into the, the meso uh, regime. All right, then entanglement. Um, so if you have the um, uh, wave function, right, with the left and the right, so it's not dead all the life, but let's just make it easier, plus x and minus x. That wave function, all right, so the first thing to notice that is that the center classical gravity being a mean field theory would, it would never be able to handle this situation. This is such a simple thing, right? Uh, Cat State has been there uh, for as long as Hurlinger has been saying that. Um, and, but if you just take the uh, average value without going to the correlation or the fluctuation, there's no hope. So let me just give you a two minute or three minute uh, short uh, description of uh, stochastic gravity. I've mentioned semi classical gravity. And so quantum information in the face of gravity, for example, is a simple 
uh, the thing like a particular cat state. Uh, my claim is that you really need to, go to use stochastic gravity. So what is it? That is in the case that you have a classical source, stress energy tensor, and then you have the quantum expectation value. Uh, if you just include up to that term, it is some classical gravity. But this term uh, is uh, the stochastic source. Now here again, uh, now of course, the theory, everything is laid out clearly. But at least the time that I was thinking about this in the late 80s is a big challenge conceptually. Right? If you look at the Einstein equation, the left hand side is supposed to be the marble palace. You should not touch it, then not kick it or do something terrible to it. Right? I think about Archimon Paul. But next to it is actually the red castle, which is the sandstone. The right hand side is the sandstone. I decided that that's something that I could play around with. And in fact, the, the challenge is how could you add on a stochastic term in an otherwise perfectly unitary or being high symmetry at all, everything, right? The TV news, you know, that we just listen to. So the, it wasn't until I uh, read from uh, Feynman Vernon that I was convinced that there is a way to do that. Um, so let, let me explain to you quickly. This is the perturbation, right wing perturbation, and most of you have seen this before. And what's new is really just this last term here. It has a lawful place for it. That's the interesting thing. And as I was just saying, the C, the stochastic tensor source, actually is, of course, mean zero, and then the, the correlation is given by what's known as the noise kernel. And it's a symmetric traceless and divergence less. So it's kosher, everything covariant and all that. And the reason for that is because really this is just the stress energy two-point function. The t mu t rho sigma. t mu nu x, t rho sigma x prime. So it's the, the expectation value, that can expectation value, or whatever quantum state that you, you like, of the of stress energy by tensor. Okay. I think you will already realize that uh, in 86 or so. There's a lot of the things on this mind that are uh, revealed later um, <clears throat> through, for example, the close time path or the Indian formulation. All right, so the noise kernel, let me just skip this part and just point out to you that if you work out the gravitational cat, again, it is non-relativistic weak field. Anybody can do that, okay, everybody who knows a little bit about quantum mechanics. You will be dealing with this quantity, if I could point it out, psi dagger psi. This is the, the psi is the end particle uh, <coughs> wave function. And if you specialize it to a one particle case, it's even clearer, right? What else could it be except for the T00 two point function? Okay, so that's the energy density. It, it shows up here, and what I told you earlier is that it actually has a deeper uh, foundation to it, uh, known as uh, stochastic gravity. So that's all I want to say about gravity no cat, and of course, uh, what happens uh, if you really stick a quantum probe there, you actually see the Rabi oscillation, which is no surprise for people in the in All right, the big picture. Uh, skip it. Okay. Graviton noise. How much time? Five minutes. Okay. Including questions? If you want to have questions, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. So the third topic is uh, graviton uh, noise. And um, if you want to understand uh, graviton without reading anything else, just read one paper, I would highly recommend Freeman analysis. <coughs> Uh, it's so eloquently explained. And basically, it's telling people forget about trying to find graviton correctly. Okay? And then Frank Wilczek, with his former student, uh, Wallach, uh, had this paper in 2020 saying that, well, maybe if we could find the noise of graviton, that would work. Yeah, okay. And um, so we, we did the calculation also uh, with Professor Cho from Taiwan. 
And um, there, there, there's a bit of uh, technicality. Uh, let me just, so for, for example, close that path, drink the carol wish in in. Um, let me just go through this quickly, uh, one minute, okay? If we look at the quantum Brownian motion, that again, uh, let's say the system is one harmonic oscillator, capital M, and then the environment is made of n harmonic oscillators, none uh, coupled. They're coupled to the system through this bilinear form, right? Because it's completely linear, it acts and Gaussian, they can be soft. In particular, I want to point out to you the uh, application of closed time path or the, the ineffective action. So you can see x plus and x minus. I usually, when I teach this uh, topic, I actually start with step map because it's easier to see from step map how you construct the density matrix from the wave function. It's always psi x prime psi, right? So uh, it's the same idea here, except Schindler thought in terms of path integral forward in time and coming back. But the main thing I want you to see is you can, well, it's a two by two matrix for the green function rather than just the final matrix in the in out formulation. So what I want you to see is you can have the difference variable and the sum variable. In between there, right, the, 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 the difference and the sum is the dissipation kernel. And in uh, the sandwich in between the difference variable is the noise kernel. And this is the one that we're going to do some operation a la Feynman Vernon. And so you can introduce a, a, a Gaussian uh, identity, in fact, uh, and rewrite this term in this form. It's up to you, you know, it doesn't matter. But what's the advantage of doing it this way? Then you can see that C can be interpreted as a classical stochastic force or noise, simply. You see, this is the crucial step, right? If you just throw in the noise, I would not pay any attention. But this actually, this is an identity. There's no approximation involved. It's just a different way of looking at it. And from here, then, you see, the noise kernel is the two-point function for the stochastic force that you freshly introduce with this uh, distribution function, P. All right. So that is, uh, even though it's a simple technique, but it's important to point out. So you've converted this way, taking the functional derivative, you get the uh, large kind equation. Now, of course, at this point, we all know this is the damping, and that's the noise. Okay. All right, so let me just jump over to gravitational noise. Okay. The system, I'm jumping too fast. Okay, the coupling, okay, uh, this is in, there are three classes of problems that we've worked on since the 19, uh, uh, 2000 or so, and I don't uh, want to spend time on any of those, but just go to the geodesic deviation, right? So this is the slide again, courtesy of the Cho. Right, so we start with the Einstein action, and the weak field, right, perturbation, that's the graviton action. And then we're interested, the system is actually uh, two point masses. We're interested, the system is the geodesic separation, right? So graviton noise in the environment, the influence of that, the effect of that on your geodesic separation. Really simple setup, right? So I just wanted to point out to you, well, here is the, the, uh, the two terms when you expand this out, right? With, uh, Z is, by the way, is the geodesic separation. It's the same, uh, um, it's the formal uh, steps, right, as the uh, quantum Brownian motion that I just showed you. And so you can see that, of course, it's now a four-legged animal. The delta is the second line, then the delta delta. That is the noise kernel that we're after. And in the same way, you can cast it in terms of a noise source, the PC, we're keeping the same notation for easy identification. And finally, right, the stochastic effective action after you use the Feynman-Vernon 
um, uh, reduction or, or uh, identity, uh, Gaussian identity. And here's the dissipation kernel, and that comes from the noise kernel. And you will see this more clearly uh, with the uh, line defining equation, right? The dissipation and then the noise. Uh, earlier, I flipped the noise to the right hand side. That's all the difference. Okay. So, okay, good. So, uh, what we did was we looked at different uh, quantum states. The vacuum doesn't give you much, it's very minimal. Uh, finite temperature, well, high temperature, low temperature doesn't make a significant difference. But for squeeze state, this parameter is what makes it possible uh, from where? Uh, thanks to the expansion of the universe, from the ability to use primordial gravitational waves and primordial graviton, there is maybe some hope that today uh, we could see some traces uh, effect from that. Thank you. Thank you. There's time for one please. One question. Maybe I can just talk. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe there's another way to arrive at stochastic gravity. Uh, if you have a collection of quantum systems and no classical systems are around, then I would still like to persist that they do not live on a Minkowski space-time. I here disagree with Jeremy. Uh, they rather, I think they live in a non-commutative space-time manifold and whatever we call gravity should be the curving of this non-commutative manifold, not the curving of Minkowski space-time. And then you can do some coarse graining and come to uh, semi-classical gravity plus your stochastic corrections. Uh, it would be interesting to know if these two things will match we don't need to go to non-commutative. Um, as we, uh, as I pointed out there, you can just take the expectation value of the stress energy tensor, right, as people did in the 80s. You get the semi-classical Einstein equation. You solve for that equation, <clears throat> and this is important, you cannot just take the original space time and put it in, you have to solve the semi-classical Einstein equation at the semi-classical gravity level, and then do the calculation based on the solution to that uh, equation. We, we don't need to go to non-commutative. But I, I'm uncomfortable with that. You, you are what? I'm uncomfortable with assuming a priori that a quantum system to begin with could live on a Minkowski space-time. I, I didn't say it. We have to do Minkowski. You see, I, earlier we said we've been working with early universe and pick any space time you like, the uh, standard model, and so on. So it's certainly not restricted. It's in the latter part that we go down to the low energy non Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Okay, look, I have a question to the first part of your talk talking about quantum information in the sense of creating entanglement. If we just assume very simply two particle system, massive particles with a factorized wave function, how do I get from the stochastic uh, gravity, how do I get a quantum mechanical piece to the Hamilton operator which creates superposition states? Because that's what you need. And uh, I don't see it. I mean, I, I don't see, I never understood this and the same problem with this big discussion about Vedra and Maleto, these papers. One just doesn't see where should this operator come from. Is it a miracle of the stochasticity which creates superposition? Uh, you need a very simple piece in the effective Hamiltonian which involves your two-particle wave function. If you have no superposition, which piece, where do you get this piece from which creates the superpositions which you need to have entanglement, obviously? Right, so you, you can just construct a wave function that way, right? That's what they call the cat state. Certainly in ENM, we're familiar with that. And so you do the same thing with gravity. That's all, yeah. So I think your question maybe is that how do we formulate that in the Hamiltonian formulation? Yeah, we can discuss that, yeah. But it's doable, certainly, yeah. Can I thank our speaker again?